Welcome to the JLX Friends of Benefits podcast. I'm your host, Xander Conabeer. Today I'm joined by coaches Jack Lenton and Lauren Hashem, and we're going to be discussing how JLX started, how to make the most progress, and our biggest regrets as coaches. Let's get into it. More people like thriving, more people benefiting from good coach-client relationships is certainly a good thing. A brutal, brutal workout, and I was wrecked. Thank you for tuning in, and a massive thank you to Jack and Lauren for joining us on the show today. Jack, what projects have you been uh, working on this week that you're excited about? For me, it's definitely been the Lift Our Health Workers Guide that we've been doing. It actually finishes up tomorrow night, so once this time the podcast comes out, it'll be probably long gone, but that was a guide where all the profits were donated to NHS workers, to people that are working as nurses, volunteers, everyone in the healthcare system at the moment, helping with the whole COVID-19 situation. Um, And we basically put out a actual science-backed, decent at-home guide that wasn't just kind of bodyweight work. It was getting inventive with different equipment, different stuff, and also how to make a lot of the exercises more challenging, breaking down different misconceptions. And it's just all gone down dead well I've been really happy with it both in terms of what people are getting out of it and the workouts and also the amount we've raised so far we're going to be doing the kind of official donation as of tomorrow so we'll see what that will be actually no as of Monday finishes tomorrow yeah principles that will last a lot longer than hopefully the virus lasts yeah I agree massively I think it's it's going to be one of these things that benefit people not only in terms of what we can do in, in, in the donation front, but like you said, the guide has some fantastic information which will point people in the right direction. And something that I think we've discussed and I've certainly discussed with some of my clients is that this is a fantastic time at the moment to get really good at these types of movements because once this is all over, that will remain and it will be only a massive benefit to you getting back into the gym and being able to then carry that stuff forward and hopefully in the process you'll have donated uh, whatever you can to a fantastic cause and that should do do a lot for that um, which is fantastic so hash brown what uh, what projects have you been uh, up to this week that will be uh, exciting um i am taking this week to basically just be more creative with social media so whether it be workouts I'm going to be posting the way that it's set up the way that the layout of instagram is going to look and kind of just some more better content for my audience fantastic so what did what have you kind of based that on have you got some feedback or have you just kind of gone actually do you know what i can use this time for doing some more creative things or um i'm basing it off of some of the other people on instagram that i do like their content from more knowledgeable science-backed information and then just kind of going through and seeing what's going to fit best in different like color schemes and yeah (laughs) i like that that's nice you get fancy Thanks. yeah very good what about you Xander let's hear it what are you excited about what are you working uh, on well aside from my terrible haircut um <laughs> you didn't spend long working on that <laughs> no that. I actually did this is the problem I actually spent ages doing it because the first one I did went really well and I got a bit cocky and thought oh, I could get the cutthroat razor out and get it graded from like a plane up it would look yeah. great um, but then my mirror fell off the bin due to the wind I was using and went like that straight with a straight with a one. <laughs> and I look like I've been put in a blender. So um, yeah, no, no, that's not too great. <laughs> but on a serious note, uh, I have also been looking into how to make some more a bit like Lauren, how to make posts that look a bit more advertising. Um, but also been making my way through a load of uh, content in terms of books. So I was been reading uh, Jordan Peterson's uh, twelve. Um, I can't remember what the the title is now. Well, isn't it Rules for Life or something? Yeah, 12 Rules for Life, that's it, yeah. And trying to make those rules more condensed and applicable to clients because I found that some of them are fantastic. And I fear if I can get those out in a way that is um, applicable to people in certain situations, then it should be a really beneficial thing for them um, kind of dealing with the stress of this situation. So it's been quite fruitful so far and I think it will be certainly more beneficial as time goes on as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think once you start coaching someone for multiple weeks, even, and especially once you get into like months and years, it becomes more and more about mentality, psychology, 
Right. And those are the things that are actually blocking people in certain areas. It's never just as simple as like these amount of macros or this type of training. And after a while, people come to know that, you know, and ultimately all the information you could really ever need is out there on the internet. You know, everyone knows what you should be doing, but people don't actually do it. And it's the behavioral stuff that you really need to get into the nitty gritty with. So I think for, for helping clients, that sort of stuff is absolutely key. I totally agree with that hundred percent. I think from kind of six months into coaching, it was very apparent that the people I was coaching, it wasn't as simple as going here, this is what you need to do. Can you go and do it? It was like, no, I can't really do that. It's like, well, why, why can't you do that? You know, that's, this is how we would do it. This is how you would achieve that goal. Yeah. But it becomes very apparent with an approach like that, that you almost end up adding stress to these people's lives by saying you need to adhere to this and they have no tools to learn how to adhere to that. And I know that we're all big fans of how to build habits, change habits and so on. So, you know, starting at the very bottom of that and building up, I find is a really good way to help people manage like a massive task into like little tasks um, and then expand their overall kind of toolbox in how to progress with implementing these, you know, new macros, new training regimes uh, and so on. For sure. I think it comes down to like, they also hire us because it's, they know that we know how to approach this in different ways and not just one set way. So it's like, they can't just look it up online and be like, all right, I'll try this. They know that we have certain ways to approach it that could be better for them. That, that's not good for somebody else. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I feel like we get a lot of, I've certainly heard in the past, probably the biggest complaints about like previous coaches they'll be saying things like, oh, my last coach just said, do this because I told you to, which just isn't right. a, it just, it's a non-starter for a lot of people. Like it, how, how do I do it? Why do I do it? Where do I do it? What do I do? Like you have so many more questions just beyond the actual act itself. You know, it's about everything around that and all the behaviors and habits supporting it. And yeah, if you're someone out there who has a coach that says, just do it because I said so, dump them ASAP and get someone who's actually going to be able to explain stuff to you properly and feel like you're actually a part of it as well. You know, I feel like it's some of the biggest wins we get when clients kind of come on board with your sort of way of thinking and they're almost like preempting the stuff that you're going to say as you go. And you're like vibing in the same sort of way in check-ins. Like that's where the real juice is when you've got those like coach to client connections that aren't just like, I tell you what to do. You piss off and don't talk to me for the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's fundamental in, in long-term progress. I think if you're looking for short-term progress and someone says, look, you know, I've got a wedding in 12 weeks. I think that sometimes in those situations and maybe only in those kind of acute situations, it's okay to be like, look, you, if this is really what you want to achieve in that period of time, it's going to have to be a bit more of a route one approach. But I yeah. think in terms of actually developing people in terms of their lifestyle, in terms of actually getting more out of this process, I'm exactly the same as you there. I think, you know, involve yourself in this, challenge me, ask me some questions that I have to even think about kind of my approach to this. You know, if you ask me a question, I think, hmm, like that's a really good, really good thought. You know, you know yourselves far better than I'm going to know you for the first, you know, six months maybe. But after that point, I would hope that because you've engaged in this process so much that we're going to be on that same wavelength where I say, okay, look, this is what we're going to do now for the next six weeks. And they're kind of going exactly what I was thinking. And from there, you've really got that, you know, same wavelength. But that only comes, in my opinion, from that first six months where they're putting in almost as much effort as you are to find out about each other and, you know, dive into their check-ins and really give you everything. Um, but I think going back to what you said earlier, that is damaged terribly by old coaching. And yeah. I've had clients come to me and, you know, they'll email me. I'm so sorry for emailing you on a Tuesday, but... Uh, I couldn't wait till next week. And I'm thinking, why are you, why are you apologizing? <laughs> you know, and I, I'm here to help you. Here for. Yeah. And yeah. then it's like, I wasn't sure if I could put this in my check-in because it's quite a lot of information. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I feel sorry for this person that they've involved themselves in someone else's life. They've, they've given them their money and that person's not given them themselves back. Mm -hmm. And so they feel bad for asking a question, which realistically as a process, which, solely involves them you know we can do everything our end but if it doesn't come back um, from them then it, it's a process that doesn't really ever reach its full potential um, mm -hmm. but like I said I feel like that's damaged from potentially poor coaching in the past which is a real shame for sure and to anyone who is 
a client out there or looking to have a coach in the future, I think it's worthwhile remembering that coaches get into this because they enjoy interacting with people. I know that's the same for all of us three. Absolutely. We like helping people and it feels fantastic. It's not a purely altruistic thing. There's also some inherent selfishness in the good feels you get from helping (laughs) someone out. So, you know, the more that you guys put stuff to us, the more that you ask questions, the more in depth you go, the more that we're able to help and dive into topics and do the stuff that we want to do as well. You know, I, I'm like the opposite way around. If someone gives me nothing, I'm like, Oh, what's up? Like either, either something's wrong and they're like withholding from me, or we've got some sort of blockage here and there's something that we can't communicate on. Like we haven't gone deep enough on that relationship yet. And then by the opposite end of the spectrum, when like they're just flowing and the check-ins are absolutely full and they're telling me every last detail, not just about training nutrition, but about like lifestyle and what they've been doing as well. Happy days, man. That means we've got a good open relationship and that's what you've got to have. Yeah, I don't think any of us want to go into the relationship of coaching and client with a dictatorship. Like, we're not here to tell you this is exactly what needs to be done. Like, we want to communicate with you. We want to be able to know what is actually going on so we can help you to the best of your ability. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. And as we said, you know, it it has to be that that two-way coach and client relationship. It's like you say, it's a relationship, not a dictatorship. And I think we'll all agree that's, that's going to be key. While we're on the topic of coaching, I think it'd be worth talking through briefly kind of how we actually all got into this situation. Um, Because I guess for a lot of people, they may not know how we all came to be working together. Um, So it might be worth just as as a starting podcast, just to kind of highlight that to some people and maybe let them know a little bit of how we kind of became uh, the threesome that we are. (laughs) Ashton, do you want to kick us off? Oh boy. Okay. Um, I will start off with how I met Jack, which was in university in Florida. (laughs) Jack's screen switches off. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah, we met in university in Florida. um, And we just hit it off, you know, we became best friends. And then I remember he took me through a brutal, brutal workout and I was wrecked. Um, And I was just into fitness then. But then when I lived in Australia, I just started studying a lot more fitness content, just a lot, read a lot of more articles. Uh, and then when I came back, I ended up getting my certification in fitness, nutrition, and just kept on going with my knowledge for it. And I started PTing for about a year in person and online. And then after a year, Jack kind of reached out to me and asked if I would like to be a part of the team. And there was no way that I could say no, because Jack was just like, <laughs> I tell the, him this all the time, but he is the most knowledgeable person that I know. And I knew how much he cared for his business and just really loved what he did. And for him to ask me to be a part of the team, there's, I just couldn't say no. Like I knew he appreciated me and I appreciated him. So I knew it was the right fit. (laughs) Sure. And I think it was, it was important for me when I was getting people on board to have people that I had either existing good relationships with, or I knew I could really trust or they had really good experience themselves in doing the similar sort of thing. And with you, Hashim, it was all about like, yeah, our existing relationship and the fact that I knew I could fully trust you with that. But then also your relentless commitment to learning with it. Because like when we first met, when we were first talking about fitness, you were in a different kind of camp of fitness at the time, weren't you? You know, it was more around kind of quite high intensity type workouts supersetting a lot of stuff kind of things that get you like out of breath and a bit sweaty but weren't really like progressive long term and I remember having that conversation with you looking down through one of your your set workouts at the time and being like but where do you how do you progress this over time you know you're going to start doing 120 leg extensions instead of (laughs) my answer was I don't know (laughs) yeah so then and that's how we got down that whole route of going into like you know, how to properly program and all that sort of stuff. But ever since you like got into fitness, it was just coming on leaps and bounds in terms of getting better with it and always improving with it. And, you know, getting yourself to a stage where you're able to really competently program, really competently help other people as well. And I also remember saying to you that um, it's really worthwhile getting that in-person experience and not just diving straight into like, because a lot of people I think see Instagram now and they're like, I want to be a coach. Yeah. But 
I, I massively respect personal trainers. We've all been one at some point. And being a good PT is not easy, but being a coach is different. Mm. It's not the same thing as putting someone through a training session. And so understanding those underlying dynamics of psychology and behavior and how people are going to respond to you and building that relationship, like that's all the stuff that comes after you've got the baseline experience with people. And I knew that you were putting in the time to do that. You were putting in the effort and I knew that you would on a continual basis going forwards as well. So it's a no brainer for me. That's really interesting. The, Thanks, I appreciate that. The, the point you make at the, the end there, saying that you know being a coach and a trainer is very different. I think to be a good coach, you have to have been a good trainer first because people have to trust you enough with the things that you're doing with them to be able to trust you enough with their personal life, with their marriage, with their schoolwork problems, you know, all of that stuff. And if they don't trust you enough to get them in the gym and work out with them and see you as a person rather than just this person who kind of wombles in there, does them a session, makes them sweat and leave, you know, and it, fundamentally it comes down to how much you care. I think, you know, we all know people who still train people in the gym now who don't care. They just like to go in and train people, which is fine. There's absolutely no problem with that. But for me, the difference between a coach and a trainer is that level of care and that level of interest and that level of almost um, empathy with that person. Yeah, I agree. And that, that segues into you, right? You started off as a very good PT, a very in demand PT. <laughs> so you can tell your, your side of it as well. <laughs> yeah. So I, um, <clears throat> I started off, so I went to Jack and I went to university together, but we didn't quite cross over until third year. Did we? Cause you were in America. So you started a year before me and then mm-hmm went to America, which meant we were in our third years together. Yeah. But to be honest, I don't think we really crossed paths a great deal. We might have seen each other in the gym every now and again, I think. Um, yeah. And we and were on was, the same course as well, both doing exercise yeah. science, same degree, but yeah, never really were in the same friend circles. No. And I think to be honest that a lot of the time, I think that's due to obviously you coming back from um, America. And so I would have only known you in that kind of last year. Um, yeah. By which point, I think we were both getting our heads down and preparing for what was to come. And obviously, you went far more into online coaching at that point. I went yeah. far more into in-person training. And I absolutely loved it. And I still do. I, I genuinely love um, in-person training. I think it's fantastic. And it's a way that I find I can help a kind of a different t- type of person um, to, the t- to the types of people we would generally help online. Because they're people who would typically not look into online coaching. And so they have maybe some more medical based um, requirements, things like high blood pressure, diabetes and things. And having a, like an in-person conversation with those people can be very, very interesting. And a lot of the time they're people who wouldn't necessarily reach out for help in that degree unless you offered it. So most of my clients, if I didn't kind of probe that with them and in maybe their initial form or through our sessions, it's not really information you'd find out from these types of people. So that can be very rewarding, but as Jack said, so I'm very, very in, uh, kind of, uh, in business when it came to PTing. I worked pretty much every hour under the sun um, and around that, <laughs> um, which came to a point where I was like, I kind of want more from this. I want to be able to help more people. But I was doing 70 plus hours in the gym every week. Um, my girlfriend will detest that was not very much fun for her. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, for me, it was like, I can help more people. I know I can, but I cannot give myself any more to the gym in this time. And it came to a point where I just had some more knee surgery and I was getting back into coaching um, again and like learning how to walk again and all that good stuff. And I thought, I, I want to get back into coaching, but I don't want to write my own plans anymore. So I, I got a hold of Jack and I said, oh, hey, Jack, like, I, I really respect the stuff that you do. Could you write me a plan? And, you know, can I be coached by you? And I think this was in January was it January? I think Maybe it was in December. Yeah, I can't remember the exact date. I think it was around that time. And Jack said, I'd, I'd love to, but but right now I can't. I'm too too busy. And, um, you know, if you let me know in a couple months time, then maybe a space that opens up. So I was like, yeah, I'll take him up on that. Which as well, can I, can I interject for, yeah, sure. for one second there? If your coach takes on hundreds of clients, they're not doing personalized work for you. If coaches are busy, okay. they have to respect their clients enough at certain times to say, this is as much as I can do as good quality work and cut it there out of respect for their current clients. 
Yeah, I agree. In fact, I, I can remember the message you sent me now. It, you actually said in the message um, something along the lines of, I'd love to, but it would not be respectful towards my current clients to take on more people, more hours, because I fear that in doing that, the current level of my work would um, possibly decrease for those who I already have just because yeah. I was taking on. And I really respected that. I was like, yeah, I, I like this because it was something that I did with, with PTing. And I know I say I did 70 plus hours and I did. That was how I'd coached myself to do that, you know, super organized, really got in there, you know, got the stuff done, planned at weekends, and it worked really well for me. Um, and, and a lot like you, that I couldn't have done any more, even if I could have got up earlier or I could have gone to bed later. Like this social interaction part was where I would have maxed out. You know, I could have got up earlier and, and trained earlier, yeah. but um, that's where I would have maxed out with that. And so I think I messaged you again in like April, end of March, April. That sound about right yeah and again you, i think you said the same thing i'm so sorry but it's it's the same situation and i just thought to myself I, I remember being sat there like do you know what i know i want to change i know i respect this guy i'm just gonna i'm just gonna message him and i messaged you saying um <laughs> i think i said something like sounds like you need a hand dot 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 yeah. <laughs> i think we even did make like a little bit of a joke out of it and yeah. then i remember turning to Flo at the time we were in the kitchen and i was like what if I got him on board? Like, cause I just, I'd never thought of that in the past in terms of having someone else to help with the coaching, because it always seemed like such a personal thing to do, like with personal training. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that just opened up the, the idea of like, yeah, what if? Yeah. I think you sent me back a message. Like, are you, are you volunteering as tribute? I think it said, <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, maybe. <laughs> and it kind of kicked off from there, didn't it? Yeah. Uh, met up a few times, talked about how things would work, how you do things, how I do things. And yeah, great help with like, onboarding the process and with kind of pushing my online coaching to another level as well. Because as we spoke about earlier, there's one thing being a great in-person coach, but then with online coaching, obviously you've got much more of a multinational um, client base. And yeah. working at university, I'm used to that anyway. But then you've also got things like the environments to deal with. Whereas, you know, if you're working at a university where nine times out of 10, it's fairly multinational, um, the environment's relatively the same because everyone's in that vicinity at that time. But the minute you yeah. push that out to the world, um, that was something I found was a big difference. And it was a nice difference as well, actually. It wasn't something I was like, oh my God, like this is terrible. It was more like, wow, I'm learning about where people live, like how they live in different areas. And it was really eye-opening for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an amazing, amazing reach you can have with being online now. And like the the kind of novelty of it still isn't wasted on me. Like still every time we get, you know, a new application in from Q8 or <laughs> you know, somewhere in Indonesia or, you know, these types of things. And I'm like, it's amazing that you can just connect in this kind of way. And like even now we're sat in three different locations, Zana and I both being in England, but Hashimi being over in America. And like, it's just seamless. I yeah. mean, well, the technology isn't always perfect, it seems. <laughs> but generally, like, you know, to be able to work with people online like we do in such a capacity is it's amazing. And you can connect with people that are more your sort of, not only your sort of people, but the sort of people that you want to help. Like, and that's always been the huge benefit with me for coaching, that you want to work with a certain type of client generally. And that, I don't mean that just in terms of like, only people that want to lose fat or like, uh, sometimes people will DM me and be like, oh, do you work with like everyday people? I'm like, yeah, mostly like, but it's, there's no everyday person. There's no one common person. You yeah. know, you, you're always going to have different goals, but the the one common theme kind of uniting our clients, I feel like they are somewhat self-motivated and they're coachable mm -hmm. and they respond well to coaching and to going back and forth and to building that relationship. And it would be really difficult to say, right, I'm going to do what we do. I'm only going to work with people from one county. Yeah. Because what, what are the chances in that population density there's going to be enough people for you to build a business around that, you know, with what we do, pretty slim, because it's a pretty rare, you know, hobby or job in some cases. You can get caught up in your own echo chamber on Instagram <laughs> thinking that everyone does it. But when you actually go out and about into, you know, into any normal commercial gym, you see that most people aren't, aren't into it in the sort of way that we're into it and our clients are. So just being able to expand out and expand your reach like that online is, it's an amazing thing. I'm so grateful for it. 
hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, so yeah, that kind of, uh, wrapped up that one. And then obviously we kind of built on that from there and, uh, it's no looking back ever since, eh? It's been really good. Um, <laughs> it's gone quick as well, both of so you. So quick, have, so quick. Yeah. Because Will, Jack, will be a year this month. Yeah. Uh, just over a year. Yeah. Ooh, what have you got planned? <laughs> How cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, it goes quick. And I think that's testament to getting on well with it as well. Yeah. You know, sliding into mm-hmm. the process well and... You know, eventually you, you realize that these same clients are sticking on and new blocks are rolling in and you keep them going. And all of a sudden, you're like, there's certain clients that you've been with for that whole time. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. some of the first clients that came on board. I think you're still working with those people is, is testament to the good work you've been doing. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's uh, no, I was actually looking on Friday yesterday uh, at one of the blocks I wrote out. It, I think it comes to week uh, 48. And I was like, oh, we're so close. Like, that's nearly the whole year. Um, and I like, to me, that was like, I cannot believe it. Like, I feel like I get to know this person more and more every week. I get to be a massive part of her life. In fact, we jumped on to a Zoom call last week just to kind of check in and see how she was doing. I know that obviously with everything going on with, coronavirus at the moment it's just something that i found to be a little bit helpful to some people who may just need a little bit um just a little catch up every now and again really and so when i caught up with her i was like i've literally feel like i've spoken to you about 19 times on this already but it was the <laughs> the first one um which was lovely how, how about then question for you both and i'll try and think of an answer as well people that are listening out there some will be clients some will be people that will be thinking about being clients in the future or there'll be clients of other coaches and other companies as a client what would you say are good things for them to do to get the most out of their coaching besides like of course open general communication of just whatever is going on in your life but i think but before them- you say but though before you pass that off dive in because to us that's like a standard thing that we really right. want but to a lot of people that come you know, in people's first check-ins, they'll share something to me that is like, it's nothing to me. Like I wouldn't even bat an eyelid at it. And they're mm. like, oh, I'm really sorry if this is TMI or like, should I say this? And I'm like, man, you should see what I get from like regular clients every <laughs> week. You're good. Uh, <laughs> um, so dive into okay. that. So I think one that just automatically comes to mind is when we are going through questions that we ask, like in check-ins of how are your um, hunger, digestion, sleep things of though like a lot of females get nervous being like tmi like i was on my period this week Mm -hmm. like that's not tmi that's important like physiological responses that we need to know on what's going back and your feedback for your data um whether it's being stressed from at home relationships or work um all of those things are affecting their progress or them on a daily basis so having that open communication of exactly what you're feeling when you're feeling it is going to help us help them in the long term. Um, But I think that's probably just the main thing that is going to allow them to be successful in the long run is just having that open communication. So then we can give options and ideas and different ways to approach them. No doubt. Because all we can help with is the stuff we know about, right? If it's not getting communicated to us, we don't know to to kind of pluck out a thin air and give someone a solution to it. It's got to be directly addressed. And that's why we have, you know, with the check-ins, it's kind of prompt questions that try to steer people towards. And I I really made sure all of those prompt questions, I've said this to you both before, are meticulously chosen and stripped down, like only to questions that we're going to be able to give tangible answers to. Yeah, I think a lot of people waste time with communications with clients and check-ins and stuff when they're just, asking kind of general things that no matter what answer the client gives to that, they're not really going to have a a practical solution to do something for it. You know, so every question in our check-ins, if a client gives you any answer on any spectrum to do with that, we'll be able to have something to come back with and help them with based on that answer, because it leads us into the sort of stuff that we want to be helping them with. Yeah, I agree. I think it's really interesting as well. You mentioned about um, TMI with periods. This is something I've always been really interested in. When I was at university, I always tried to compare the differences between males and females, strictly because I read something in first year which said um, women are not just small apples. And I was fascinated by that. I was like, 
women are not just small apples. And it was basically <laughs> saying that a lot of the time in the industry that men are treated like big apples and women are just treated like little apples, like little versions of, of a man, for right. example. Which just we all know is... guys do, but with less weight and less food. Exactly. And we all know that that's incorrect. Like, I've got um, a client who said to me, you know, why is this happening? Why is my weight always like this around... Um, you know, a certain time of the month. And I was like, I'm assuming you mean your period. And she was like, whoa. <laughs> and I was like, you know, <laughs> we might as well, we might as well label it because if we look at how things like estrogen and progesterone fluctuate throughout the month, it, it almost, you can see it on the data charts we have, you know, for some people, it will be such a massive fluctuation that you'll see like a decline and then like a little bump, like a heartbeat. And, you know, that's yeah. a very exaggerated um, curve. Like not everyone will be like that, but I find that especially for, females when they're in that and lauren you can vouch for this more than i can of course but when you're in that kind of frame of mind where you're trying to lose fat and you know it's all going really well and then all of a sudden your weight goes up you're like why is this happening to me but actually if you know that that's coming and you can measure for that and you can say look we're expecting this to happen and on a slightly different level of a lot of the powerlifting clients i've coached in the past some of the ladies i've coached can be absolute demons when they come on their period some of them <laughs> don't want to see the gym and I've trained ladies who have terrible migraines who are sick during that time and don't want to touch a barbell which is obviously understandable so it's like programming for that can we push you a little bit harder now or should we take the foot off the gas then and that's mm -hmm. all stuff you would never ever know to do if you didn't ask the question or you didn't get the answer yeah which for me leads into what I was going to say for, for my point to this question and that is demand more of the person who's coaching you it is perfectly okay to want more for your time and for your money. And I think that in especially the Western world at the moment and, and in the UK, we're all so polite at like, sorry for taking up your time or yeah. I'm sorry, this is a bit, you know, OTT. It's like, don't be sorry, get more for yourself, do more for yourself, <laughs> want more for yourself. Like that is fundamental in you getting through this process because in six weeks time, 12 weeks time, 18 weeks time, I don't want you to look back and go, oh, wish I'd asked him that in week two when I thought about it not leaving it to the last week equally yeah. like being honest with that and saying that I know I eat far too much at the weekends and I don't track it. If I tell him he's going to be really angry, we won't be angry. Like to me, I just think kudos for owning up and, and saying, you know, this is what I'm at, that this is what I'm doing. Help me be vulnerable and ask for the help. And I'm speaking for all three of us here, but none of us are going to turn around and be like, what the hell do you do that for? Because that's not helpful to either of us it's going to be a conversation where we're like, why? Like, what do you think is, is causing that? What behavior do you think we can adjust? And again, it all circles back around to the points that we've both made in that without knowing these things, there's nothing that we can do to help them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to bounce off that, it's like not just being open about your communication with how you're feeling throughout your process, but also question us on like why we're doing things, you know, why we're taking certain approaches. I've had clients you know, 30 weeks in be like, I've been wondering this, but I just haven't had the chance to ask you. I've been a little nervous. Like, why are you doing this with my macros? Like you've been with me for 30 weeks and you're just letting me do this. Like you can ask me week one, like I'm more than happy to go ahead and walk you through the process of why we're doing something or be open about your fears too. That's extremely important. So then yeah. we can be able to change our approach to help you with them. What about yourself, Jack? I would add underscore the stuff you guys have said for sure. I would add a kind of second vote onto those. And I'd also say, remember that you and the coach together are a team. It's not you versus the coach. It's not, I've done something wrong and therefore he or she is going to tell me off for it. And again, if you have that dynamic with your current coach, get a new one because problems that come up with dieting with training with lifestyle with relationships with sleep with hunger all these things are not easy to solve and they're not straightforward you know they might be simple in the sense of like you know what you should be doing but actually implementing them and changing your behaviors isn't a, an easy thing to do and so you have to face that as a team you have to be kind of shoulder to shoulder is the way i put it looking at the problem rather yeah. than against each other and clashing and then that ties into what you guys have said about being able to be open in the communication of that, not being afraid to ask for answers and ask for reasons why. And ultimately, if someone is 
giving you good information or at least what they believe to be the best information they've got access to, they're never going to be offended by that. They're never going to be triggered by that. And again, that would be a, a time to step back and think, what am I doing in this situation? If you yeah. say to someone, you know, why are we doing this type of training and they blow up on you? Like if, if they believe in what they're doing and they know why they're doing it, then they'll have a good logical answer for it. So see it as a team, see it as a relationship. Remember that we can only help with what we know about ultimately. And so the more that you can share, the, the better for us. That's what we can help with. And that doesn't mean that sometimes you're not going to get some tough love. You know, some clients listening now will be very familiar with some tough love weeks where I have to drop my voice down a couple of octaves and speak very slow and deliberately and be very uh, direct, should we say, with people. You know, there's times for that. And it's always with clients that I know can handle it. And it's ultimately because I know they're capable of more and I demand more from them. And I know they deserve more, which is inherent to that. It's not just about telling people off because I get a kick out of, you know, being in control. It's actually about really letting these people actualize what they can achieve and holding them to the standard that they tell me they hold themselves to as well. If you come to me and tell me that you've got a goal of X, Y, Z, I'm going to hold you to the behaviors it takes to achieve X, Y, Z. Yeah. And it may be a hard conversation some weeks of saying, look, you're telling me this, but you're doing that. What do you want? Yeah. Let's be honest about it. So actually, that's quite an interesting point that you've kind of brought us up to because a client asked me a question. And I think this kind of links in a little bit. A client asked me a question on Instagram a couple of days ago, which was, as a coach, what is the one thing that you regret? So is there a thing that you regret as a coach? And we've spoken a lot about what we expect from our clients. But is there anything you can think of that you guys would say, actually, do you know what, like, I regret doing this, whether that's maybe business. It was directed more at a, uh, a coaching perspective, but you can change it to business. We've all obviously had our own businesses, so it'd be interesting to know if you guys have got something for that. Have you got one, Zander? Yeah, I'll one kick one us one off one if you one. like. Go yeah, it, mate. What you so when I, first, um, when I first started coaching, and this is for any new coaches out there, I would take this advice and I would have changed it about myself a long, long time before I did. And that was when, obviously, we were in university. They, they, and in fact, when you do any course, they shove this theorem down your throat that is, you have to do this to get results. Like, this is how you program. This is how you diet. This is what calories are. Da, 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 da. Which is all fundamentally fantastic. But like we alluded to at the start, what I did then is I spent ages writing out programs for people that would last 12 weeks. I would spend ages writing out all of these things that were optimal. And... I would then say, here you go, like, this is what you need to do. And again, like I said, this applies more for, for new coaches or coaches who are doing this now. And when you have people who have busy lives, which pretty much the majority of people do, and or maybe not now with everything going on, but you know, in, in, a, in a general sense, what I would be more conscious of if I could change it now would be that circumstance that not everyone can get up at six o'clock in the morning. Some people have to get their kids up and take them to work. Some people cook dinner and then it's like, now I'm so much better at understanding that actually that this may be the only 15 minutes they get by themselves. So encourage them to go for a walk with their partner in that 15 minutes. Don't just be like, okay, you know, go to the gym because it's just not reasonable. Um, and a thing with that, and as most of our clients will know, we don't program weights. You know, we don't say, right, you need to be smacking this, 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 this. There'll be weeks where I go, you know, I expect this this week. You know, we should be pushing on with this now. Um, and obviously those who are strength athletes will obviously get much more of that because they're more targeted towards that but I did that at the very start and looking back it added so much pressure to these people and their lifestyles than I was adjusting for in that so when they didn't hit these numbers I was just like you're obviously not doing the plan properly you know I was one of those guys and I look back at that with real disappointment in one verse and I think I made these people's lives worse for that period of time not better but I also look at it with a great deal of gratitude in the, ex in the extent that I think I learned a huge amount, like almost seemingly overnight, one kind of weekend and it kind of hit me. I was like, why is no one really you know, thriving off this process yet? Why is no one enjoying it as much as I am trying to get them to enjoy it? And I realized then that it was purely the pressure I put on them to achieve these things rather than actually getting from them what they wanted to invest in the process. And it's a bit like we've been discussing. You have to want to invest to yourself, your time, your money, your 
effort into something if you want to get something out. We all talk all the time about how if you want a goal, your actions on a daily basis must align with that. But what I hadn't done as a new coach was figure out what those actions were or how they did that. And looking back, as I said, I almost felt like I let those people down. And I didn't. I changed my ways very quickly once I figured that out. And honestly, people's results boomed. I got loads more out of these people. And I think that I still see a lot of coaches do that whole why. Why have you not done this? Why have you not achieved that? You know, without actually preparing the backroom stuff first, which I know we all do now. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a regret of mine. It's a bit, a bit maybe around the corner, but certainly something I think on every now and again. Yeah. So to bounce off that, it's kind of like the feeling of letting them down. So when I was an in-person, like personal trainer, that environment is completely different. So it's like, I'm with you for 30 minutes to an hour. That's all I see you for the week. Like I wouldn't write them plans for the rest of the week or for the rest of the month. I wouldn't give them any more like background information or background knowledge on food, macros, or just taking walks, anything to help with their goal. It was, I'm in for that hour. Cool. We're done. I'll see you next week. And it's like now being able to do all of this online, you kind of realize there's so much more to that than that session with that communication, with all the different factors that come into play. And taking that from being in person, it's like, I feel like I let those people down of, okay, I'm with you for one week, like one day of the week, but I'm not really helping you in any sort of way. Like, yeah, you're getting in some exercise, but I want to be able to truly help you make a difference. That's why I did this. And that's why I started this journey. And for the longest time of eight months, I was just like, all right, once a week, there's your plan. I'll see you next week. And it's, it just kind of makes you think there's so much more I could have done, even though it wasn't asked of me. Yeah. And now that's kind of what we do is just go that extra mile and do more than what we are expected, hopefully. I think it's dead tough for PTs though, because I, I fully agree that in an ideal world, that's what we would have all been doing when we were PTs, but you don't get paid that way. You get paid right. per hour. And mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people who are PT clients expect you to show up as best you can for that hour, understandably. And then if they want more above and beyond that, it's really hard to then upsell people on, well, I'm also going to build you out a plan or I'm also going to give you nutrition information at a different time. Because there's sometimes like this inherent belief that like, well, that should be involved. You yeah. know, like why, why don't I have a plan for when I'm not seeing you, mm -hmm. but that takes time. You know, if you're going to build out a good quality plan, it takes a lot of time to really build that around someone and build it from scratch. And so it's, it's a hard kind of balance to be able to monetize that and do it well in terms of like yeah. a business sense and get what you're worth, you know, get paid what you're worth, but also be able to yeah help people enough and deliver above and beyond just the sessions there. Just on that point, I actually adapted my session plannings out very differently um, because I exactly what you just said there. I was thinking, I'm getting paid to do that hour. Like, how do I work out the rest of it? So what I did is I started, this is a good bit of advice actually for any PTs who are still doing this, is charge per session, not per hour, because you could be 45 minutes or you could be an hour and 15 minutes, depends on what they need. You know, I'm not going to drill someone into the ground for an hour if they just literally need 45 minutes. You know, it's not a case of, what can I fill my hour with? It's what do they need? What do they need from me? Mm -hmm. And so what I did is I started charging per session. So I never once said, you know, it would be 12 hours. It would be 12 sessions. And then in that price, I will have uh, basically costed for all the extras I would do. So if someone messages me on email or they want a new plan, like they'll obviously only need a new plan every now and again, but that would all already be included in that. So when people have said to me, like other PTs, like how do you charge so much? That actually, if you look at what I do, I probably charge less than you, but I give them so much more, which means that in doing that, they see the value and that's what it has to be. What value are you adding? You know, so for us, for example, like Lauren just said, we're going above and beyond and hopefully people are, are getting that much out of it. But again, it makes it difficult if the clients aren't giving us enough in the process. So if for in-person clients, for example, you know, they do that hour, they do that 45 minute session with you. And then around that, they go in the gym and they do their other three or four sessions. Um, then you, you get a lot more out of them and, and they'll be able to ask you better questions and the whole relationship improves. Um, and I found that in terms of like say monetizing it, that was a really good choice. And although at the start I was like, how am I charging this much? I then actually thought, well, actually I, I'm worth it because I'm doing this and, and I care and I'm giving way more time than any other PTs I know. 
So actually, if you break it down for its cost, I'm actually charging no more. But my service is hopefully, I would say, much, much better. Yeah. Which I think Jack attested for saying that you were a very well and high in demand Stop trainer. <laughs> 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 but that's what you get you know i think the problem with the industry is and jack touched on this i think very briefly at the start and not in a great deal of detail but people see the price tag that we put on it or they see the price tag that a pt puts on it and goes that's wicked like, i want to earn that per hour but it's it's like the whole story of the goose and the golden egg if you don't look after the goose which is fundamentally the clients and how you mm -hmm. handle yourself in those sessions you're going to get no golden eggs and a lot of people see like the price tag as the golden egg. Oh, I'm just going to go for that. But if, if you don't nurture these people or nurture yourself in reading more, in becoming more uh, socially adapted to different situations, you know, like we were talking earlier, if someone says something that is TMI to you and you're like, well, I don't want to talk about this, then they're not really going to open up about stuff in the future. And that can be a bit of a struggle um, if you're trying to build that relationship. With that, shall we move on to our last question? So we have a good question here, which is what currently, so obviously if there was a time that you wanted to allude to, you can, but <laughs> at the moment, what habits are you currently trying to create or behaviors are you trying to create and what habits or behaviors are you currently trying to get rid of? So things that may be a little more negative that you're thinking like this is not benefiting me uh, at the moment. Jack, do you want to kick us off with that one? Yeah. Yeah. I've got a, a good couple for these. Wicked. The first one being the one that I want to eradicate and do a lot less. And that is negative self-talk and very much on a subconscious level for me, isn't necessarily stuff that I say to myself out loud, though sometimes is sometimes I'll be shouting at myself across the apartment and, <laughs> <laughs> and lambasting myself for something. And what I realize is that I would, never speak to someone that I love like that whether that's Flo whether that's my little brother like I would I would never think these things of those people and some people who are close to me in my life at the moment have had some tough times and have had rejections and have had things that have happened to them and I haven't thought one single iota anything different about them my love for them has not changed by any decimal place I still respect them I still love them I still care for them and I still, I saw the process, for example, that went into that thing that they ended up getting rejected from. And I respect them for that process, for the work that they did, for the time that they put in, for the integrity that they had when they did it. And then I realized that actually I don't give that same love to myself. And even though I can go through a respectful process, I can put a good amount of time into something. I can do it with integrity. I can go through all of that. And then if I get to the end outcome and it's not perfectly the end outcome I wanted, I will slate myself for that in a way that I would never speak to anyone else in that same sort of way. So I'm really trying to bring down that, that kind of tone and the level of anger towards myself, even though it doesn't manifest outwardly in anger. I'm not like a, you know, punch stuff and get mad kind of guy by any means. I've been very fortunate to tamper that shit down extensively through meditation and inward kind of practice but it just manifests in a subconscious way of when I realize actually what I'm saying to myself in my brain when I'm by myself it's not so hot it's mm. not nice stuff and that's the big one that I want to get rid of that's really interesting I, I'm very uh, I, I feel you on that wavelength of I think you can correct me if this isn't the same for you but when you hold yourself to a high accountability of how your actions uh accrue results and things it's almost like it's a frustration that there's you know when you're the only person in that room or that person contributing to that task like i think sometimes for me it's i don't know what else to do with that frustration i'm just going to give it to myself and exactly what you said there like katie will say to me like if i did that you would never treat me in the way that you're currently treating yourself mm -hmm. and when you said that about you know treating your family uh, members and, and loving them no different i think that, that really resonated with me as something that I do terribly. I treat yeah. myself in a terrible manner in comparison to, you know, for example, if um, I miss a session because I'm just not feeling it that day and I think I'll just push it to tomorrow. I've got a rest day planned tomorrow, but today would be the better day to take it. I just think, oh, you're weak. Like, what's wrong with you? But this <laughs> the client said to me, 
hey, I've got a rest day plan tomorrow, but actually I pushed it a bit hard yesterday and I'm a little sore. I would get more out of it if I did it tomorrow. I'd be like, great choice. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> I think it also shows that like, not a lot of people would probably think that of you, Jack, like just based off your presence and the way that, or like any of us, how we speak with our clients. They always yeah. think like, oh, they're, I don't want to say perfect, but like, maybe they don't have this struggle of self-doubt and self-doubt talk. And it's like, we do, yeah. but we always have things that we have to work on as well. And I think not a lot of people would think yeah. that of you. That's something. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I actually shared that one on my story um, in response to some of the questions that I got on a, a Q and a sticker that I got and have multiple DMS as a follow up of like, you're killing it, dude. What do you mean? <laughs> and like, and look, I agree. Like, there's a lot of things that I'm killing it in and I feel fantastic about. But I promise you that no matter what level you get to, that little voice in your head can always scale up with you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, there, there's, there's always something, man. And it's, it's really easy when you're at some level and you see someone doing something differently to say, oh, well, if I just had that thing or if I was doing that thing, I'd be sweet. Like, mm. Life would be fine. Yeah. I promise you it just doesn't work that way. And yeah. it's, it's mm -hmm. just the quintessential reason is why money doesn't buy happiness, for example, or not all successful people are the most happy people, you know, all those sorts of cliches. They ring true because of that. There's a massive level of, what they call it, hedonic adaptation. When you yeah. just, you get adapted to your normal circumstances and surroundings, and all of a sudden something that used to bring you happiness doesn't so much anymore. And you best believe that, especially with the internet now, no matter where you are in life, there's always going to be someone up above that you're going to try, try and compare yourself to. And actually, just on that note quickly, one thing that I've shared with clients a lot lately who have been saying that in terms of comparisons, when they're comparing themselves, say, up the ladder, quote unquote, I always say to them, if you're going to be doing that, you sure as hell better compare yourself down as well. Because oh, yeah. there are literally billions of people who would be rubbing their hands together with glee to be in your position mm -hmm. right now that's a great so point it's unfair to only compare yourself up against one way you know you gotta go go both sides take the average mm. um mine is so i've been working on the overall habit of trying to run away from silence for probably the last couple of months hey, i used to be pretty good this. at it <laughs> yep <laughs> um i used to be pretty good at it and then i think i got caught up in the whole i need to stay busy to be productive sort of mindset and it just runs you into the ground at some point and you mm -hmm. don't feel comfortable in silence anymore. Uh, so one thing that I noticed is making little changes and the one that I'm currently working on is to stop checking my phone when I'm eating, whether I'm by <laughs> myself or whether I'm with a group of people. And it's so easy to do it with a group of people too. Like we're all just sitting there and you have that awkward silence and nobody's comfortable. So you're like, I'll scroll through Instagram till I find something to talk about. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm by myself, like, I don't want to hear myself chew and have to think about something. <laughs> like, so yeah, I think it's um, trying to be more comfortable in the silence and just take it all in, be present with that moment, even if it's just eating. Yeah. Especially yeah. topical for, for right now as well. Right. I've been, Yeah. I, I think I was speaking to a friend of mine who's also quite down, probably way more so than me, actually. I say also way more so than me down that path of spirituality and like you know meditative practice and that sort of thing and I said to him I was like man you must be thriving right now you've been training for this for the last like five years mm -hmm. like this is this is everything you've been waiting for like time by yourself quiet with no distractions like it's amazing to me how many people were struggling with just that as itself mm -hmm. like not any external circumstances I get that there's worries there's potential concerns and some people are obviously in much worse situations than others around this but to people that haven't lost their job, but say they're in the position where they've been furloughed and they're still getting most of their pay, but they're not working and they don't have any family members and friends who are ill and they live in a comfortable at home situation and they're still having a ton of problems with this. Mm. To me, it begs the question of like, what's up internally if you can't just sit with yourself and hang yeah. and, and enjoy that silence sometimes, or just a lack of stimulation, like from a phone, for example. And that's easier said than done. There's, that's a very complex question and there's very complex answers to that, but mm. I think yeah. it's very topical. I think the interesting thing with that is I read this um, in someone's book a while ago. It might have even been Tim Ferriss's, that Tool of Titans book. I think it may have been. And there's a section in there which talked about being comfortable being bored. 
and um, actually, was it that? No, I think it was a different book, but nonetheless, he talks about how in the 21st century and the age and era of technology, no one is comfortable being bored. So for example, when you're eating, you can't sit there and just eat because there's <laughs> nothing to do. It's like, okay, well, I'll scroll through this while I eat like this. And actually this plays a huge role in how we feel satiated with food as well, because we're not actually concentrating on what we're eating. We're actually concentrating on this. And before you know it, your whole plate of food is gone. It's like, oh, um, I'm actually still hungry. I've not really enjoyed that food. But similarly, like I played some card games with um, a few members of my family at Christmas when I just read this. And when you win this game, you basically put your cards down and you sit there and basically see who comes last. And it was amazing how everyone just kind of went like as soon as they were out. And I just sat there with my hands on the table trying to practice this. And my brain was just like, get your phone out, get your phone out, get your phone yeah. out. And I was like, oh, but, but it's yeah. weird because it ruins meaningful and social interaction. You know, it was my brother I was playing with and, I, you know, um, a couple of other of our family members. And I thought we could have a really meaningful conversation now, but everyone's on their phones. Mm -hmm. Like if we could just all get off our phones, we wouldn't be bored because we'd be talking to each other. But <laughs> yeah. everyone struggles with even the smallest amount of boredom now. Um, and I think mm -hmm. there's going to be a swap soon where people start to find more meaningful ways of being bored, whether that is meditating, whether that's reading, whether that's having a conversation with someone on the train that you wouldn't usually talk to. Obviously, you don't talk to strangers and all that. But um, <laughs> that kind of stuff is far more fruitful than just aimlessly scrolling. Mm -hmm. And that kind of brings me through into my habit change at the moment. And that for me is being grateful. I used to do a lot of gratitude practice and recently it's completely fallen off the bandwagon. Um, and I've got to a point where I've seen a lot of things I used to see as really good stresses now as really negative stresses. And I feel it build up in me and I'm like, ah, oh, this is so stressful. And actually when I look back and Jack, a bit like you said, if you look down the ladder, at some of the people, if they looked at me now and looked at the stresses that I have, they'd be like, oh, I'll take them, you know, because they're really positive stresses. You know, I worry a lot about my clients and how their lives are going. And like, it's nice to have that care about someone. It's nice mm -hmm. to be able to care about people like that. And to me, I'm like so internally worried about them that I haven't taken a step back and gone, I should be really grateful to have these people to be worried about, to have such fantastic people who are open with me and who tell me about their problems for me to be able to feed back into that and be concerned, but also to be in a place where I can manage my systems well enough to be able to outsource my worry to somebody else. Um, so that's something I'm going to work on again is, and it kind of feeds into my positive is to stop with the negativity so much, but actually to build back up on the, the positivity and to look at, you know, really journaling that stuff and being grateful for even the smallest things. Once again, it's a powerful flip because it's so easy to get into those negative loops, like with my negative self-talk and everything else that you can do with yourself in those sorts of scenarios. You have to make a conscious effort to flip yourself out of it. And it's definitely possible, but it's also ephemeral. It's not that you make this change once and then you're just missed mm -hmm. a positive and nothing's ever gonna you know, affect you ever again. You're gonna float through life on a gold carpet. Like you've got yeah. to really make it a regular practice and a a disciplined practice is really yeah. the thing. But one of the things that that same friend said to me a little while ago that really, really stuck with me is just that he's not special. He's not, you know, gifted in any of this stuff. All he does is give himself over to a practice every single day. Yeah. The idea of like giving yourself mm -hmm. over to something that you know is going to be good for you, even when you don't feel like doing it, even when it's raining outside even when your dog's scratching at the door, even like whatever the circumstances, just focusing on your practice and doing it. And that could be a multitude of different behaviors throughout a day or whatever, but always bringing yourself back to that because you know it is going to be good for you, no matter whether yeah. your higher self or lower self, so to speak, <laughs> is, is making the decisions at that time, depending on how you're feeling. Mine, yeah, mine was a lot more um, fitnessy, a lot more straightforward. I'm trying to really make a consistent effort to get in enough calories to still be gaining lean muscle, still be gaining weight, despite the fact that we are in lockdown in the UK at the moment. And I'm working out with a couple of bands and a couple of jerry cans and not a lot else. Don't forget your faithful be... rock. Where's the rock? Where does the rock, rock get a mention? Yeah. Yeah. Come on now. <laughs> that was so faithful for you until you got those jerry cans and threw it out. It's down to my, it's down to my left right now. He's not on the <laughs> Got a little lead. <laughs> <laughs> 
so really just trying to eat enough um, because my calories are, are silly at the moment. I often tell people I don't have a fast or slow metabolism. I have an adaptive metabolism like to the max. So if I'm having yeah. to get really, my calories have to get really, really low. As soon as I start ramping things up and I'm trying to gain, they see just climb, and climb, and climb, and climb. My weight stays very similar. So um, yeah, putting over over 500 grams of carbs a day and over 60 grams of fat every single day. <laughs> you know, because of the amount of activity. Yeah. And it's, it's great for the first couple of days, but then, you know, you get two, three weeks, in, you don't want to see food anymore. And we no. have these conversations with clients all the time yeah. about, you know, how to make sure that you're like minimizing food volume and how you can handle having that sort of intake comfortably. So really just push myself to do that. Even when, again, I have those kind of lower self moments of like, Oh, but it's kind of nice being shredded and like, Oh, you could still be. <laughs> <laughs> actually just pushing forward with it and making sure that I'm, consistently gaining regardless and the other fitnessy one tied to that is to keep up my cycling i've been cycling a lot yeah. more since lockdown mm -hmm. and yeah looking to to get a good time for a, a 43 mile course in the next couple of weeks so keep putting in the effort there alongside the weightlifting stuff as well that's been a really nice outlet especially with the weather in the uk yeah. home it's been belting lovely so. <laughs> perfect to get out Finish us off then, Lauren. What, what's the positive that you're trying to implement into your current style of life? Uh, mine goes back to uh, what I'm looking forward to this week. So based on creativity. So whatever intention that I have set for the day. So if it's to be as creative as possible with social media, I want to take 10 to 15 minutes in the morning upon waking up of doing something that's going to get me in that headspace or get me in that action. So that could be you know, playing guitar for 15 minutes or drawing, just doing something that's really going to spark that sort of, you know, brain, like brain waves or whatever to get me into the day and actually make me feel creative and have it last. I love that. Very nice. Something that I think is, is well worth telling the people at home about is the sorts of things we might speak through with clients quickly on implementing positive behaviors or yep. getting rid of negative ones. And mm -hmm. there's, a couple of things that come to mind for me and you guys can add to this and, and modify them as you please. One thing that I always say about the good behaviors is reducing friction around those. So for example, Massively. with Lauren's example there, doing it first thing in the morning, no questions asked, no other distractions. You haven't already started working. So things have come up for you or you can make excuses about time. No friction that actually wake up first thing in the morning and you do it right. And really minimizing friction around the stuff that's going to be good. So that could be, if you want to work out first thing, laying your clothes out the night before. So the actual clothes that you have as like a yeah. default option to put on in the morning are your workout clothes. Because something as simple as that can save you from five minutes of hunting around your wardrobe and your drawers and actually just going, oh, I'll stay in my dressing gown, yeah. whatever, <laughs> you know? And then you, you, then you just don't work out because you're not in the right clothes and you're not in the right mindset. Right. So minimizing the friction for the good behaviors and then um, just the straight flip side of that, the mirror is maximizing friction for the bad behaviors. Yeah. So the example of looking to your phone when you're bored, this is something that I really try and endeavor to do. If I'm spending quality present time with flow or with family, my phone's in another room and I yeah. don't look at it. Same I never have notifications yeah. on any time of day because I, I feel like it's not up to other people to when I check my phone. So really turning off those notifications, having it somewhere else, because if it's by your side, just by default, you're going to grab it and look yeah. at it naturally. So yeah, I agree. maximize the friction with those bad things, minimize friction with the good things, and that should get you off to the races. That's a good start. Which I think I've noticed a lot on Instagram. You mentioned the point of setting out your gym clothes the day before. I've seen so many Instagram people be like, hey, let's work out in our pajamas today. <laughs> like, I'm like, no, you're not setting yourself up for success. Like uh, you are just trying to just be your most comfortable self while in this situation yeah. of COVID. And mm. I just thought that tied in well with it. Yeah, but, absolutely. I think just to top off Jack's point there, environment is a huge thing when it comes to building habits and behaviors. And something that I know a lot of my clients have been struggling with is working out, eating and resting all in the same room. So they are working out in their lounge, for example, yeah. obviously, some people aren't fortunate enough to have huge houses or, you know, garden space or people who live in um, New York or London, for example, it's simply never going to be possible to have that kind of space. I find it really important to set that environment up to an extent that you know you're going to be working out. 
So for me, that might be having a, I don't like coffee. I'm actually started drinking coffee, but that might be having some kind of caffeine, setting out my headphones, getting into a vest and some shorts, um, you know, putting a mat down. So visually that area is changing and, and you know, I feel a bit pumped up. I feel a little bit more um, aware that my mat's out, my weights are out, it's workout time. And then once that's sure. finished, about clearing all of that away and, and just spending kind of two or three minutes in that area, not necessarily meditating, just being like, my workout is over and really reiterating that that area is now back into what area it needs to be in. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, Jack, if you can minimize the resistance for that, it might be that the night before you lay that out, headphones on the mat, weights are out, um, you know, you've got your coffee prepared, ready to hit the switch. So when you get down in the morning, it's a simple case of getting that done. It's so easy to talk yourself out of it if you don't. And I should say for people listening to this, if you're thinking about the sorts of things we're asking, or if you're thinking about coaching, or even if you've got questions about your current coach that isn't us, or a coaching service you've seen or whatever, DM any of us. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. like ask us stuff, ask questions. Like We promote that honest, open communication with everyone, not just clients, and we're always going to be kicking you the real deal. So if you've got questions about any of it, about the coaching process, about something you think might be off from a current coach, or anything like that, let us know and we're never in the business of trying to like slate certain people and just promote us like i want you to have a good relationship with your current coach even if that's not us because more people like thriving more people benefiting from good coach client relationships is it's only a good thing 